what we do, and here's a good example, for places like an airport, where we were given the job of reducing stress levels in Glasgow Airport, is we create a generative soundscape. So you may be able to hear this, got a bit of bird song, soothing, safety, very slow moving musical elements, which are designed to be uh, calming, very, very slow tempo, so it's in training people down. The effect was it reduced stress levels in that uh, airport considerably, and the airport were very happy because sales in the shops went up. I guess because people were feeling a bit chilled out and didn't have to rush so much. So it is possible to create soundscapes, not music, but soundscapes which are like oral wallpaper. Okay, let me just go back to listening then. I just want to uh, close th this conversation about listening because it's so important that we are losing our listening. And that is not insignificant because listening is the doorway to understanding. And if we don't listen, then we're on the way to violence because not understanding people allows us to dehumanize people and it creates conflict, judgment, prejudice, bias. All of those things are made possible if we don't listen. I, for one, am very concerned by a society where listening is becoming rarer and rarer because it puts us on a road which we don't want to be on. I'll just give you some exercises uh, which I, I speak about to everybody about listening. You may well do some of these already. I'm going to go through them very quickly because um, I'm aware of time. Silence is the first. Silence is so rare these days. Just a few minutes of silence every day recalibrates like a sorbet in a meal, resets the ears and allows us to have a context. All sound comes out of silence. The second one is an exercise I call the mixing desk, where we can sit in a place like a cafe with sound like this and just think about how many different channels of sound am I listening to. It's a very good exercise for developing listening skills. And it can be done in a beautiful place as well, like a lake, where I can start to say, well, how many birds can I hear? How many ripples? The third exercise is savoring. And this is a funny one. Most people uh, consider this to be slightly strange, but I love it. I mean, for example, this is the sound of my tumble dryer, which I recorded before I came here. That's a waltz. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. I could put that under a piece of music. It'd be quite groovy. So I get into listening carefully to even mundane sounds like this, or here's another one. There's glory in a kettle boiling. It's the hidden choir in the world around us, and it's good fun to do. Listening positions I'm not even going to go into here. I don't have the time, and it's too deep a subject. But just to say that we don't just listen from one place. There are so many different places we can listen from, and it's fun if you start to play with that, like the caring professions know about active listening, where you reflect back to somebody. Or there's uh, passive listening, where you just listen. Or what you're doing now, critical listening. Do I agree? Is he saying something interesting? Is this rubbish? That kind of voice going on all the time. So listening positions. And finally, a very important little acronym for anybody who's engaged in communication. This is about listening to people. The acronym is RASA. RASA is the Sanskrit word for juice. And I think it's quite a, a good acronym to use for this simple little listening technique. Receive, as in eye contact, paying attention, being open, pointing at the person. Appreciate, mm -hmm. really, oh, little noises like that, especially on the phone. I'm not very good at this on the phone. People sometimes say to me, are you still there? So little noises, keep it flowing. Summarize the word so, wonderfully important in good listening. So, what you said is this. So, I hear this. So, does that mean this? And then finally, asking questions. So, what happened next? Do you mean this? That all engages. That's good listening practice. We need to teach that. I want to finish just by talking for a moment about the ontology of listening, because it's important, and you are listening specialists. Have you ever thought listening places us? 
in the world. It places us in space because we listen to a room like this and we can hear tiny, tiny little sounds that tell us how big the room is, where the walls are. There's a blind guy in America who can ride a bike perfectly well using sonar. He's listening to the reflections of his clicking and he doesn't bump into things. So it's a human skill that we all possess, places us in space. You can hear the little noises of people around you, but it also places us in time. I would suggest that sound is the main way we experience time. There's always time embedded in sound. There's no such thing as a sonic photograph. A moment of sound is meaningless. Hermann Hesse calls music time made aesthetically perceptible. So time, space, listening places us in the world, in the physical world and in the spiritual world as well, because most people don't see God or whatever that means for you. It's normally heard. And it places us in the world with other people as we listen to each other and connect. I live to listen, it's my job. But what I hope we can achieve, and with your campaign, uh, I really, really feel optimistic that this is a big step towards this, is helping people to listen to live. It's like turning up the color on a television set. When you start to listen consciously, the world is a much richer and more beautiful place. So, just finish with some things to do. And this is things to do for all of us as human beings. Listening consciously, crucial. The second one is taking responsibility for the sound that we make. Now that follows from the first. If we start to listen consciously, then we don't sodcast because we're aware of the effect we're having on other people. So becoming conscious of our sound output. And complaining, incidentally, if you're in a loud place, complain. And you probably do that, most people don't. Let's rediscover silence together. Let's get it into schools and universities and homes. Silence is golden, just a little bit every day. We need to start honoring music and not using it as some sort of veneer, some sort of disposable wallpaper. It's not that. It deserves to be treated better than that. Designing with sound, making soundscapes at home, in offices, in factories, in shops, and designing for sound. This is where we need to engage with those town planners and those architects who all too often don't think about the sound of the things they're making. They make a thing that looks great, and then we have to go and live in it. So designing for sound as well. And most of all, we need to teach our children these things. I want to see listening taught in schools. That is the antidote to all of this. And then we bring up a generation of people who are really listening to the world and going, well, why does that sound like that? We're not going to put up with that, and things will start to change. If we start to become conscious in our listening, we then become conscious in our creating. That is the way to achieve sound living as a civilization. I want to thank you very much for your attention, and for anybody who wants to connect with me afterwards, I really... I'm sorry, but I can only stay for half an hour and then I've got to go to the airport and catch a plane. Happy to take any conversations and there's some ways that you can connect with me afterwards and I'm going to leave you with a bit more birdsong. Thank you very much. <laughs>